I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and welcome to this CCNA and CCNP video training session on floating static routes. And this term is right up there with frame relay cloud. The first time you hear it, it's like, how can a static route float? Exactly what is it floating on? Well, these are the questions I asked myself years ago when I first heard this term, and judging from my mail and feedback from my students, thousands of other people have had the exact same response. So we're going to start this video with a little bit of a review of the roles of static routes and then default static routes because we have to have those down before we even look at a floating static route. The syntax is much the same with one important difference. Then before we actually configure the floating static route on live equipment, what we're going to do is take a look at a real world scenario where I used a floating static route once uh, to good effect and you never know when that could come up on an exam either. So it's a good command to know as far as the floating static route goes and important for the real world as well. Let's take a look at those regular static route rules. You're always going to use the IP route command to create a static route, whether it be our regular basic static route, a default static, or floating static. Now a basic static route is going to be indicated by the letter S and the letter S only in the routing table and you're going to use a network or subnet mask which you're not going to use as a wildcard mask as you would say in an access control list. And then finally the command, the IP route command that is, can indicate either the local router's exit interface or the next hop IP address. For default static routes, you're still going to use the IP route command, but you'll have all zeros for the destination network in the mask. So it looks a little odd with all these zeros going across, but that's what a default static route's going to how it's going to be configured. You will see the letter S with an asterisk if it is a default static route, because the S of course is for static and the asterisk indicates a candidate default route. Then finally again, we can configure this with either the local routers exit interface listed in the IP route command or the next hop IP address. So where the heck does the floating part come in with a floating static route? You know, what's it floating on and why do we care? We're going to take a look at a real world scenario here in a moment and it on occasion you're going to run into situations, could be on the exam, probably definitely in the real world uh, one day, where the use of a dynamic routing protocol is either prohibited, say by the client, or it's just not appropriate. Why would that be? Why would we have a situation where our dynamic routing protocol is not appropriate? What do those routes have, or what do those protocols have that a static route does not have? There's a little bit of overhead because if we're using either RIP version 1 or 2, we're sending full routing updates out every 30 seconds by default. If we're using OSPF, we've got the hello packets, which are not as much, there's not as much traffic there, but it still sums. And then with the IGRP, we have hellos as well. So there's always going to be a little bit of overhead with your routing protocols. Now let's take a look at a diagram here. It's something I ran into once and you may have seen something similar to this. You'll notice that the router at the top actually has three different ways to get to the 172.12.23.0/27 network. It could go to this router and then be there. It could go through the frame relay and go to this router and then be there. Or it could take this path. But notice, and it's something to watch out for on exams and in real-world network documentation, don't assume a routing protocol is running over every segment. Because for whatever reason, whether the client just doesn't want us to put a routing protocol over the link between the two routers on serial 1 over the 210.110.24 network, maybe it's a slow link, we don't want the overhead, whatever reason there is, we have RIP running on the frame and on the Ethernet segment, but we don't have it running on the direct link between those, uh, those two routers. So if we want to configure a static route between those two routers, we could do that. But the problem is, is that the administrative distance of a static route to 172.12.23.0 slash 27 would be much lower 
than the AD of the other two routes, the ones that are being discovered by RIP. And I'll show you this on live equipment in the next part of this series and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about because no matter which routing protocol you have running, the administrative distance of a static route is going to be lower than that of any dynamic routing protocol. Whether that routing protocol is EIGRP, OSPF, or RIP, it doesn't matter. So we've got a bit of a situation here then where we want to use this link as a backup link. We want this link to come up or be available in the routing table only if the, the RIP discovered routes are gone. So we can't just write a regular static route for that because if we do, the regular static route is going to take precedence over the RIP discovered routes because of the lower administrative distance. Now by changing the administrative distance of a static route to a higher value than that of a matching dynamically discovered route, the static route floats. We're actually not going to see it in the routing table. It'll only go in the table if the dynamically discovered route or routes leave the table. So that's another good reason to know your administrative distances. Now I know especially you CCNA candidates, believe me I've been there, sometimes you're memorizing all these numbers and you're thinking, am I really going to use this one day? You'll definitely use administrative distances in your career and definitely on your exams. Just a quick review here of those important ADs, EIGRP, the internal EIGRP routes have an AD of 90 and if they are discovered via route redistribution they're considered external routes which have an AD of 170. OSPF routes have an AD of 110. IS to IS, which is not on the CCNA exam but is on your BSCI exam, has an AD of 115. And then finally RIP 120. But we know that a static route is going to have a lower AD than all of these. So that is where the problem comes in. In the second part of this series, I'm going to bring up a live rack of equipment that exactly matches what we just saw and we'll configure a floating static route and a regular static route and see the differences between the two and the impact on the network. In the meantime, I want to invite you out to the tutorials page on my website, thebryantadvantage.com slash tutorials.htm. We've got over 300 videos, practice exams, and fully illustrated tutorials there now, and a lot of great information is on the way and some different training methods on the way as well to that page. Also, visit my YouTube Cisco certification channel at youtube.com slash user slash ccie12933. And then finally, I invite you out to the website blog. We've got daily practice exam questions, a free webinar announcements, and a lot more coming. And that's at the bryantadvantage.blogspot.com. I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video, and I'll see you at the website.